Islam is a system that encourages and promotes knowledge and science. Islam is a system that strikes the balance between individualism and socialism. Islam eliminates religious excess and ritualistic innovation. Islam is a religion which is against religious intolerance and extremism. We cannot say that a person is, we could say a Muslim is, we could say a person is a Muslim extremist, a Christian extremist, a Muslim criminal, a Jewish criminal, a Christian criminal, we could say that. But we cannot say that Islam is an extremist religion because Islam by definition means a law that Almighty God has established for equity between the human beings, which is surrender and submission to his will. And God is not an extremist. And we cannot indict Jesus Christ for what Jim Jones did. We cannot indict Jesus Christ for what Charles Manson did. And he said he was the coming back of Christ. We cannot indict Jesus Christ for what Hitler did. We cannot indict Jesus Christ for what Timothy McVeigh did. Then how can we indict Islam for what perhaps some Muslims do? It's only fair. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. You heard that before. What's good for you has to be good for me. To be equitable, you can't say one thing for Muslims and another thing for Christians. That's not fair. I haven't heard any headlines, although all of the murder, as a matter of fact, I was wondering why 56 Catholic priests, cardinals, bishops, that are very close, I mean exceptionally close, to the Pope. 56 who are convicted pedophiles and have been pedophiles, convicted over a protracted period of time, none of them were called Christian criminals. Yet they were, they were endowed and entrusted with the lives of young children whom they corrupted over a protracted period of time. It wasn't like a few weeks. I mean like 30, 40 years. That's like the fox being in the ch chicken house for 40 years. <laughs> and it's not even really being in the chicken house, it's being in the chickadee house. Because they were not even chickens yet. But not one headline said Christian criminals. As a matter of fact, they doctored it up as if they needed some kind of psychological help. It was a little mistake, and uh, we just need to uh, work this thing out a little bit. And uh... that's not an indictment against Christianity. This is not an indictment against the Vatican. Those were just some people who were entrusted with religious sanctity. But it's the nature of human beings to fall into traps like that when they fool themselves about something called celibacy. It don't even exist. Don't even try to be celibate. Don't even try to tell me that. There's something you're doing to balance it out. Now, Islam is a real religion. Islam says no celibacy. Whether you want to be a, a, a Muslim minister or you want to be a woman that is want to give herself to God, you still need a husband if you want to make a family. That's what Islam says, because Islam is a religion of clear, moral, social balance and rationale. Islam is a religion of pure, and wholesome moral principles. Yes, in Islam, alcohol, drugs, fornication, adultery, gambling, illicit sex, sodomy, child molestation, pornography, all of this is considered to be immoral and unlawful. Straightforward, Islam says, 
We don't dilly dally about it. We don't have to do no voting about it. It's not a matter of individuality. 567 million abortions in Islam is considered to be murder. That's what we call it. That's what the Quran calls it. A life that you do not own, you do not have a right to take because you made a mistake. If you wanted to have free sex, you should know when you get pregnant that it's not free. <laughs> Islam is a religion of research, development, and progress. Islam is a religion of high culture and the development of human civilization. What do we want as Muslims? We want to invite people towards respecting themselves, building a high relationship with Almighty God through the behavior of the prophets of God, through following the law of God, and building a fraternity of godly people, whether they be black or white or yellow or red from the east or the west or male or female, whether they are rich or poor, a global fraternity of godly people who will do what? Use the book of God and the example of God's prophet to resolve their problems wheresoever they are. And yes, if you live in America, in the South, if you like to eat fried chicken, that's okay. You can keep that culture. We don't have to all eat the same food. We don't all have to dress in the same clothes. We don't all have to speak the same language. We all, as human beings, just need to do what? Use the law of God and the example of his prophets and our worship and our godliness to establish relationships between each other. This is the proposition of Islam. The proposition of Islam is the first acknowledge God. After acknowledging God, adopt God's law between us. And after that, worship God so you adopt morality and decency. This is the proposition that you and I can find, you and I can discover, and you and I can maintain the purpose of life. Islam is a system with built-in answers. Islam is a system that has solutions to human problems. Islam is a system that addresses the misery of mankind, the degradation of mankind, the debasement of mankind, the problems and the tragedies of mankind. Because if a system of life cannot address those problems, it is not suited to be called a universal system. Islam is a system that reconciles the relationship between man and God, between man and woman, and between man and man, human beings. Islam is a system that sets down contracts of behavior, whether in marriage, whether in business, or in worship, and does not separate these things into compartments. It's all under the law of God and according to the behavior of his prophets. Islam is able to fulfill all of this because unlike other religions, other systems, and other philosophical ideologies or isms, it has, Islam has, one, a comprehensive and unchanged scripture. The only system of life in the world that has a comprehensive and unchanged system since it was revealed and is memorized, was memorized in the time of the one whom it was revealed to, has been memorized by millions since that time. And the proof is that there are some sitting here that have memorized all 6,626 verses, like it was memorized before. It is the only scripture from God that has been retained as such. The proof of that is simple. If all the Christians of the world, all the Churches, all the congregations, all the individuals agreed one day to take all of their books and throw them in the ocean. To take all the Bibles and throw them in the ocean. And all the Muslims said, we too will take all our books, the Qur'ans, and throw them in the ocean. 
the Christians would not be able to produce another Bible because they don't even agree today what is the Bible. The 354 different denominations, all of them claim 43 different Bibles, different books, different number of verses, even Old and New Testaments. And no one among the Christians, not one, not one in the world can claim that they have memorized the whole Bible because they haven't agreed what is the whole Bible. But there are millions of Muslims, maybe five or ten just in this room, who have memorized the entire Quran so that if we threw all the Qurans, they're just books with ink. Of course we respect it, but if we threw them all in the ocean, <coughs> we could bring ten Muslims from ten different countries that didn't know each other, and they could all stand here in this room right here and start from the beginning. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين and then they can go to the last surah أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل أعوذ برب الناس ملك الناس إله الناس من شر الوسواس الخناس الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس the first and the last and the 112 surahs in between and they would all agree and then the Quran would come right back again The second demonstration of the superiority of Islam and its system of life is that Islam has a human example. Now this is the most powerful thing because everybody wants a hero. And I don't mean, I don't mean that, that, uh, that long piece of bread with some meat and cheese in it that they have in America. That's, that, they call that a hero too. I mean, a hero means somebody that I look up to, somebody I want to be like, somebody I can imitate, somebody that inspires me, somebody that can guide me, somebody that I feel that my life could be like theirs. Everybody in the world wants a hero, but Almighty God already knows that about the human being. And so the, hu the Almighty God gave the human being over different periods of time, heroes, but he called them prophets and messengers. But those heroes, those prophets and messengers came to their own people. Then after Jesus Christ, because he said, I'm going to send you another hero. I'm going to send you a counselor. His name is the Admirable One. His name is the chosen. His name is the praiseworthy. His name is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Jesus said in that upper room, he told his companions, don't be afraid, I gotta go. I have to leave. So be it, after I leave, the comforter, the counselor, that admirable one, he will come. For if I don't leave, he cannot come. That's what Jesus told them. You will know him because when he comes, he will not speak of himself. But whatsoever he hears from God, that shall he speak. What does that mean? He will not come with his own words. He will not come with his own poetry, with his own ego, with his own ideas, with his own opinions. He will not come like that. But whatsoever he hears from God, that's what he will come with. Hear from God means what? What God reveals to him. By what? Inspiration, revelation. Second thing Jesus said, your hearts and your minds are not prepared for all the questions you have. So be it. When that counselor comes, he will relate all things to you in detail. That's the second thing he said about him. The third thing he said, you will know him because when he comes, he will speak of me. That's what he said. 
And the fourth thing he said, that which he hears from God will remain with you forever. Those are the four conditions. Now the Holy Ghost or the angel Gabriel didn't fulfill those conditions. And certainly Jesus Christ did not come back and fulfill those conditions himself. So the question here is, who, what came after Jesus Christ that fulfills that prophecy? Only one man. First of all, let me tell you that this book has in it a chapter called Mary. Now, who is Mary? Who is Mary? The mother of Jesus. So if a book that Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, claims that he heard from God, he didn't say, this is from me. I'm bringing you guys a book that I wrote, that I published, that I want you to read. No, he said, I heard a revelation from God. The angel Gabriel that visited all the other prophets brought me this revelation. So the characterization of this book is what he said, what he heard from God. Did Jesus say that? The second thing is, he said, your hearts and your minds are not prepared, but when he comes, he will explain all things in detail. The Quran says, verily this is a book that explains all things in detail. That's the second thing. Then he also said, he will mention me. The Quran has in it a chapter which is called the surah called Maryam, the chapter called Maryam. And in the chapter Maryam, the birth of Mary, it mentions first the mother of Mary. What's her name? Hannah. It mentions how Hannah prayed to God for a son and that God gave her a girl. And when she asked God, oh God, you gave me a child that I prayed for, but it's a girl. I cannot give her to the priest of the temple for her to become a priest. God said, so be it. She will be one of the chiefs of the women in the hereafter. Who is that woman? Mary. But God gave the Hannah the boy she asked for through her daughter. So God gave her a double gift, gave her a daughter that will be the chiefs of the women in the hereafter and gave her the son that she was asking for through her daughter, which was who? Jesus Christ. And not only did God give her the son through her daughter, but made her son Christ Jesus, the Messiah, who was born without a father, the word of God and the spirit given to Mary from God. The Quran says that. So Jesus said, he will speak of me. Not only does the Quran speak of Hannah, not only does the Quran speak of Mary, not only does the Quran speak of the immaculate birth, the phenomenal birth, the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ, but the Quran also talks about his miracles, how he healed the lepers, how he caused the blind to see, how he caused the deaf to hear, how he caused the, those who couldn't speak to speak, how he caused the dead to be risen from the grave, how he fed the masses of 10,000 or more people from what? Seven loaves of bread and fish, and how he blew his breath into a clay pigeon and caused it to fly. How Jesus Christ did these miracles God says he did it by the power of whom? Himself or whom? By God. The Quran. Does it confirm Jesus Christ? And fourthly, he said it will remain with you forever. For it to remain with you forever, it has to be intact from the time it was revealed. This is the only book that was intact from the time that it was revealed. So the natural progression of the life of Jesus, the natural progression of the love of Jesus and his message, the natural progression of the gospel of Jesus, the natural progression of the life 
of all the prophets and the system given by all those prophets, the natural progression of that is the Quran. The natural progression is Islam. And that human example is the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Let me leave you with this. Just tie yourself down a little bit. Settle the good in your seats. I'm going to ask you a question. The Quran says, certainly, there is for you, human beings and believers, in the messenger of God, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most profound pattern of human behavior. Now that's a challenge that God has made to the world. Now this challenge must mean that it should be able to be proven that Muhammad categorically is the most profound human being that has impacted upon humanity. That's what it means. Now let's see if we can prove that. First of all, let me see if out of these 1,000 or more people that's in this room of these intelligent, educated, sophisticated, knowledgeable, endowed, mature human beings, is there anyone here that has heard of anyone that they'd like to stand up and say that they believe is the most profound human being that has impacted upon humanity categorically? Now, we already talked about the prophets, so it had to be probably one of them. Surely couldn't have been Winston Churchill. Couldn't have been Bonaparte Napoleon. It can't be Michael Jackson. It can't be Michael Jordan. It can't be Michael Tyson. Who could it be? It's not your father. It's not your grandfather. It's not the president or the premier of this country. It's not George Bush. It's not Tony, Tony Blair. Who is it? Who's the most profound human being that has impacted on humanity in documented history? Who is it? Well, I'll give you a hint. Five biographers of this age. Five graduate premier biographers of our age, all of them non-Muslims, did a study to determine the hundred most profound human beings that have impacted upon history. Three of them conclusively said that it is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Muhammad ibn Abdullah and one of them whose name was Michael H. Hart. Now you can go check this out for yourselves. Michael H. Hart, he said that his choice would have naturally been Jesus Christ because he's a Christian. But he had to admit that Jesus Christ was not a father. He was not a husband. He was not a ruler. And he was not a statesman. So just on those issues, he said that he had to acquiesce to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, because the competition in that case was only between Jesus and Muhammad. So if Michael H. Hart, who would have chose Jesus, admitted that categorically, we're not saying that Muhammad is better than Jesus, we said categorically more profound impact because Muhammad was a father, he was a husband, he was a statesman, and he was a ruler, and Jesus Christ was not those four. My brothers and sisters, my respected non-Muslim guests, my proposal, my proposition to you is that our purpose of life here is that one, we need to acknowledge Almighty God. Number two, we need to conform to Almighty God's law. Number three, we need to follow and admit the prophets of Almighty God and adopt their lives and their ways. And we need to begin as human beings to worship introduce worship in our lives, a worship that is accepted by God. And whose worship is accepted by God? The worship of his prophets. Our purpose in life is to acknowledge God, conform to God, and worship Almighty God. I appeal towards you. I suggest to you, I propose to you, that all of you who are non-Muslims, Whatever denomination that you are, whatever kind of human being that you are, that you acknowledge now 
that you acknowledge in your hearts, in your seats, where you are, that there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God. Can you do that? Can you do that? Those of you who can do that without any hesitancy, just like a blink, just like a knee jerk, just like if I said your name and I announced that I had $1,000 here for you, if I called you up and said, come on down. That's right, if I told you to come down and you were up there, you might fall off that balcony. It would just be automatic. So I'm asking you a simple question. Can you admit? Can you declare? Can you at least raise your hand that there's none to be worshipped except the Almighty? Can you raise your hand? No, Muslims, put your hands down. Now I'm asking the non-Muslims here, that's the proposition I'm making. Can the non-Muslims that are sitting here that I can see, can you raise your hand and tell me how many of you can accept that there's none to be worshipped except God? How many? Count them out for me. I can't see with this light in front of me. Can you raise your hand for me, please? Don't just do like this. Raise it up there, let me count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Is anybody? Thirteen, fourteen. 15, 16, 17. Now let me say this to you. To say that there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God, that itself is to be Muslim. Now I didn't say that makes you an Arab. I didn't say that makes you an Arab because all Arabs are not Muslims and all Muslims are not Arabs. As a matter of fact, only 19% of the Muslim population in the world are Arabs. To be a Muslim is just to acknowledge, first of all, that there's none to be worshipped except the Almighty God. And to be a little bit more definite, it means to accept that Muhammad is the messenger of God. That Muhammad is a messenger. If you can't say the final messenger of God, that's because you just don't know. But if Jesus, if Jesus prophesied Muhammad and Muhammad confirmed Jesus Christ and their morals were the same and they were brothers of the same prophecy, then Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he had to be what he claimed to be and that is a messenger of God. Now among those who raised their hands, is there anybody here who can also accept that Muhammad is the messenger of God? Can I see the hand, please? One. Can you stand for me quickly? Just stand for me. Come right here, please. I want, to make this, uh, I want to make this transition or this transaction because this is what it is. These are human beings that's making a transaction with God. They're not making a transaction for us. They're making a transaction with God and a transition in their lives. So I want to make this easy for them. We have a gift for them and we're going to give them this gift which includes, give each one of them, I'm going to tell them what it is. Give each one of them one, please. Let me have one of the packages, Aki, so I can tell them what it is. Yeah, it's all gave it to you. Hmm? It's all gave it to you. Okay. Now the gift that we're giving to them is something that will help them on their way. One, it's a copy of the Quran with the transliteration of the meanings. Secondly, 
It's a short, easy to read, authentic biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Thirdly, it is a set of seven books. It is a set of seven books that have in it lessons for new Muslims. Now, your acceptance of Islam is your acceptance of God, not your acceptance of me, or not your acceptance of these people, nor your acceptance of the political dynamics in the world, because it has nothing to do with that. It's just your acceptance of God. And this gift is to help you make that trans transition. Did everybody receive a copy? You have a copy? Wonderful. I want you to say with me the simple words. And these words are nothing more than what I have explained. There's no trick, no curve, and we don't have a pool in the back for you to dip in. Who? She's, she's right here. Yeah, yeah, she wants to make it for the river. No, she's here. My brother, who is, um, and rightfully so, is very concerned and very inspired about one of the ladies who are here. And I also, because she was brought here last night by her son. And I mean, that's profound. That's the most profound gift that a son can give to his mother, and that's certainly the most profound gift that a mother can give to her son. And that's our sister Pam that's here. And I'll meet with all of these um, I'll meet with all of these um, fortunate and, um, and special people after we finish our meeting here this evening. But let's say the words. Let's just go over the words called the Shahada, the bearing of witness. And I'll tell you what it is. Essentially, it is the saying of that there is none to be worshipped except Almighty God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Saying that word and then adding to it, I testify or I declare or I announce that there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God and that I testify or I declare or I announce that Muhammad is the messenger of God brings you all into the transition of Islam. From that point, it's your sincerity. It's your acts of worship. It is your commitment that will make the difference. Now, whatever you owe God of something you did that only you know and God knows after tonight, your board is clear. Because God is the forgiver of those that come back to him. But whatever you owe somebody, money, rent, a loan, you still owe that. <laughs> is that fair? Okay, please, just say after me. The words, la, la, ilaha, illallah, Muhammad, Rasulullah, ashhadu, an la, ilaha, illallah, wa ashhadu, anna, Muhammadan. Abduhu, Abduhu, wa Rasulu. Sallallahu, alayhi, wa sallam. Amin. Now, what I want to say to uh, to you, brothers and sisters, and honestly. Um, I am truly grateful in the sight of Allah 
uh, not because I'm going to get paid for each one of you, <laughs> because it's not about that, uh, but I'm grateful because when, I'm look, when I look at you, I see myself 37 years ago. And I do realize, I do realize that sincerity and commitment and straight talking can change a person's life, because it certainly changed mine. And what I want to tell you is that all of you are fortunate because certainly someone brought you here tonight. I mean, your own inquisitiveness, your own concern about life sort of navigated you here or brought you here, but someone, some Muslim who you have as an associate or a relative brought you here. That person is your sponsor. That sponsor should help you work out your problems and your transition. Now, because I live in the UK or because I'm from America, it means that I'll be a long distance mentor, friend of yours, brother in Islam, and open for your, to help you resolve your problems. But the Muslims of Sydney, Australia, and in particular, the sponsor that brought you here, your relative or your friend, those are the people that should work things out for you, yes. That's right. She said, it doesn't even have to be a person that you know because God might have brought you here. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. Now, unfortunately, tomorrow morning, I'll be going to Melbourne and coming back on Thursday. And what I would like to do is to arrange to have dinner with all of you when we get back. Can we arrange that? <laughs> Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. So please, take your gifts. Uh, I can't shake hands with you pretty ladies. <laughs> May God bless you so much. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, normally, normally when we um, end our lecture, we usually have some questions and answers, but I really think to myself that everything has really been served. Now, if there are some non-Muslims who are sitting here who were not prepared, who were not prepared now to step forward, to um, make that commitment, or to make that decision, that's okay because there's no pressure involved. And if you have some questions that you would like to ask me privately, uh, I'll be available for about 20 minutes after this lecture and the brothers can uh, bring you to that designated place and I'll be more than glad to sit with you. Uh, for those of you uh, who are not prepared to even do that, that's fine. I want to thank you. I want to thank you immensely just for coming out from your house and for sitting here just to find out what was our perspective of the purpose of life. Um, and I would like to say that I think now that minimally, uh, if somebody says to you something erroneous about Islam or our perspective of life, at least I think what you should do is set the record straight. That we are decent people that we are God-loving people, that we are people who want to be good, law-abiding citizens and productive and progressive, and that we just simply want to invite people to, or we like to hear, have our proposition to the world considered. That's all. And I think that we should have that right along with anybody else that has a system of life or religion. Would you agree? And that, if anything, we want to complement Sydney, Australia, or Australia, or the UK, or any other place in the world where Muslims reside. Right, reside. That's what we want to do. I want to thank you very much. And I, my suggestion is that we don't do a question and answer, because I think that those people that stepped forward 
and the time constraints that we have right now. But what I'd like to ask you to do is that all of you have been given, I think, an envelope when you came in or sat down. Now, that envelope is not for you to write your name and address on. That envelope is for you to deposit what you like to, contribution towards the Islamic Teaching Institute and its work, and the One Islam production studios here in Sydney, Australia, the first of its kind in Australia. Now, you can do whatever you like with the envelope. You can fold it up, mail it in later on. You can fold it up, throw it away. You can blow in it and hand it to us. Or you can put something in it that you think represents your contribution relative to what we tried to do. We want to thank you again. May God bless you, and may Allah guide you. One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, to lead Words, pray. Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims.